And let's just look to the Lord in prayer. Father, we thank you for your grace upon our life. Thank you for gathering us again to, uh, today, Lord, uh, to on this Lord's Day to worship you, to hear your word, Lord, and to um, align ourselves, O oh Lord, with your intentions and your purposes for us. Father, we just pray today that you will quieten down our hearts to, Lord, not be so um, troubled by the things that is going on in our life, but to set aside this hour, Lord, to worship you and to to draw near to you. May your presence be with us today, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Come, let's all say the Apostles' Creed together. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, Creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, His only Son, our Lord. He was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, He rose again. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of the saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and life everlasting. Amen. Amen. Well, turn to your neighbor on your left and right and say, let's get ready to praise and worship God. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen, church. We're gathered here today in the house of God. And we know that we can cast all our cares upon Him, for He cares for us. So let us enter into His gates with thanksgiving in our hearts and into His courts with praise. Let's give Jesus a big hand. Hallelujah!
us close our eyes and quieten down before God. Today I would like to share a verse from 1 Peter chapter 1. The title says, A Real Reason for Hope. In verse 4 it says, God has something stored up for you in heaven where it will never decay or be ruined or disappear. You have faith in God whose power will protect you until the last day. Then he will save you just as he has always planned to do. So today let's remember that he will save us just as just as he has always planned to do. Today let's cling on to our living hope. No matter what you have been through, no matter what you are going through, let's cling on to Jesus, our living hope. When we sing the song, let's declare, even when you don't feel it, that he's with you, he's with us in our very situation. So let's just lift up our hands.
Jesus a hand. God, there is none like you. And today we come to give you all the honor and the glory due to you. May you, O oh God, once again be exalted in our midst and also as we study your word and know more, Lord, of your faithfulness to your people. That we too, Lord, like what you have sung today, truly have hope in you, Jesus. May you encourage us, strengthen us once again. Let, Lord, your words remain in our hearts, in our minds, always, as we go through our lives. We thank you, O oh God, and just commit the rest of our time to your hands and ask, O oh Lord, that you move by your Spirit and lead us by your Spirit. In Jesus' name we pray. And everyone say, Amen, Amen. Let's give the Lord all the glory and honour due to Him. Amen, 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 Amen. Praise the Lord. Well, so good to see so many of you today. And uh, just before you sit it down one more time and just say that I'm happy to see you in church today. Amen. God bless you. Okay. Thank you so much, singers, musicians.
Well, I thought that I'm going to have half the church here because it's uh, Swifty, right? The Taylor Swift uh, concerts are on now. But uh, yeah, I'm glad you're here. Maybe, um, yeah, maybe if Zhang Xueyou's concert, then maybe it we'll <laughs> shows that we're a bit older now. Okay, but anyway, uh, just very happy to, to, to see many of you and I just have a few short announcements. Then I want to go to, straight to the word. Today, we are covering a few chapters, uh, so it's going to be a bit, slightly, uh, the sermon will be, I think, slightly longer, so I just keep everything short, all right? The first I want to uh, tell you is that this coming Easter, uh, which is the month end, we do not have a Chinese hall, on the praise hall, so we will have a bilingual service, a combined service, and we will start at 5 p.m., okay? This coming Easter, 30th of March. Then uh, thereafter, we, we are we're trying to work out if possible to have, I mean, by God's grace, if possible, we can have a dinner together, but we are, we are still working it out whether that can be done. Then for the youth uh, ministry, they are going to have a youth group Bible study uh, every third week, every third week of the month, okay? So actually, I just want to tell you that the youth service, they are, yeah, first of all, originally they are made up of the youth from our own, you know, church uh, family, right? But more and more they have new people coming to join. And I also want to tell you that they, they are consistently doing uh, intentional discipleship, really wanting the youth to grow in God's Word. So, so what I'm trying to say is that if you know anyone who are younger, your, your nieces, nephews, uh, your own children, I want to encourage you to, to encourage them to, to go to the youth service, okay? I think they will have a, a, a very close fellowship and they will really grow in God's Word together. Uh, today I have a very uh, good news, and it's, you know, I introduced this thing called family time. Okay? So this is a bit of a family time now. Uh, we have one of our church members, right, Abigail Say. Let me just make sure I read nice, uh, properly. This is the first time that the Singapore Chefs Association sent a Singapore National Junior Culinary Team for this International IKA Culinary Olympics that is held in Germany in February this year. So our church member, Abigail. Abigail, where are you? Will you please stand up? Yeah, Abigail, please stand up, okay? Yeah, and the mother, Wendy. So Abigail was one of the team members. You may be seated down. She's one of the team members who participated in this competition and she's solely in charge of doing the dessert for this competition. This competition is a five-course dinner that they have to prepare. And she's the one in charge of the dessert. And the Singapore team won a gold medal in the competition, all right? Wow. <laughs> Praise the Lord. Congratulations. So, so proud of you. Uh, and of course, Wendy, right, our old-time member, okay, she has a proud mum moment, uh, you know. And so, I'm very happy and we celebrate this. Uh, CGF celebrates this victory with you, Abigail, and Wendy. Okay, one more time, let's give them a big hand, okay? Praise the Lord. Awesome, awesome. Okay, so that's all. Uh, I would just want to collect the offering and then I have uh, asked Cindy Moy to come and read the scripture for us today. So I wait upon you as the Lord has blessed us. Let's give to Him uh, out of the abundance He has given to us uh, in worship to Him. All right. Father, we thank you for uh, this church and we thank you for this community and that all the blessings you have given to us and may we, O oh Lord, now return the portion of it to you as our worship, to honour you and to ask, O oh Lord, that you continue to sustain the work of this ministry and also the good works that this church would do. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Okay, okay would you take out your Bibles and let's turn our Bibles to Isaiah chapter 11. I'll be looking at Isaiah chapter 11 and 14, but primarily uh, Isaiah 11 and 14, these two, these two passages. Okay, so we just read from verses 1 to 9, Isaiah chapter 11. Isaiah 11, verse 1 to 9. Verse 1. A shoot will come up from the stump of Jesse. From his roots, a branch will bear fruit. The Spirit of the Lord will rest on him. The Spirit of wisdom and of understanding the spirit of counsel and of might, the spirit of the knowledge and, the f and fear of the Lord, and he will delight in the fear of the Lord. He will not judge by what he sees with his eyes or decide by what he hears with his ears. 
but with righteousness he will judge the needy. With justice he will give decisions for the poor of the earth. He will strike the earth with the rod of his mouth. With the breath of his lips he will slay the wicked. Righteousness will be his belt, and faithfulness the, sh- the sash around his waist. The wolf will live with the lamb, the leopard will lie down with the goat, the calf and the lion and the yearling together, and a little child will lead them. The cow will feed with the bear, their young will lie down together, and the lion will eat straw like the ox. The infant will play near the cobra's den, and the young child will put its hands into the viper's nest. They will neither harm nor destroy on all my holy mountain. For the earth will be filled with the knowledge of the Lord as the waters cover the, the sea. Amen. Yeah, thank you so much. This is the word of God. Now, this pas- these passages or, or these verses that we have read, right, are quite familiar to us. At least we have seen before. Of all the passages in Isaiah, you know, those who... Who, whom shall I send? Who will go for us? Are familiar passages. Isaiah 11 is probably quite familiar. The Spirit of the Lord will be upon him. The Spirit of wisdom, counsel, and might. Another passage that we just read will be the lion and the lamb will dwell together. All those passages. So today we will look, go through them and we will see uh, whether we need to renew a little bit of our previous understanding and help us to see in the context of Isaiah and how this speaks to our situation in our lives. First of all, let's just do a bit of a quick recap, okay? Now, we know that Isaiah is a prophet to the kings of Judah, but primarily to warn them not to trust in the nations, especially not to trust in Assyria, because Assyria is going to come and they will destroy Israel. And then they are going to turn against Judah. Eventually, what will happen is the Babylonians will come. Actually, this is God's word to the kings. I find that the book of Isaiah, as I studied it and read it, right, I find that it is actually a, a book that also speaks to you and I as leaders or people out there who, who are in some sort of positions of influence and leadership. That how do we carry out our life? How do we, how do we think? The word of God must, must have become a lamp to our feet, a light to our path. So th- there's this this um, message that Isaiah continues to bring. Repent or there will be a judgment that will be coming to Jerusalem. And there's, but we also see in Isaiah's prophecy that there's always hope after judgment. That means in the, in the passages on judgment, there will always be a portion that says there's a future restoration. It's almost as if judgment will surely come. But let me tell you this, even... If that may be, God will bring back a remnant. He, in His judgment, He always remembers mercy. So He'll bring back a remnant and there'll be a restoration for the whole nation of Israel. Right? And then, ultimately, we see that the fruit that will come out of all these chaos, judgment is like chaos, is repentance and a trust in God. So God is saying, Trust in me, trust in me. The, as human beings, we say, no, no, no. We want to do our own thing. He said, but let me tell you this. If you do your own thing, bad things is going to come. Judgment will come. Ah, we say, ah, we don't believe in it. And true enough, the judgment comes. But after that, the fruit that comes out of it is, God, now I will trust you. Now I'm willing to humble myself before you. You understand? So the next question we always ask is, why must the Bible be full of judgment, judgment, judgment? Well, I want you to know this, okay? That God chastens His people really to remove pride and arrogance in their life. When things go wrong, okay, it is so that you and I have an opportunity to have self-reflection. You say, why do we need to evict them? Why must the Babylonians come and take them as cap- captivity, take them as captives, and then bring them to Babylon. I'll give you an example, okay? Supposing you have a, a house that you're renting out to someone. Okay, so in good faith, you rent it out, tenancy agreement, all signed, all done. But six months into the 
tenancy agreement, the condo management called you and said, you are the landlord of this property, right? Say, yes. Can you please come now? Something urgent has happened. And you went down and you realised that your tenant has been asking people to come to the house for late night parties to the point that they get drunk and then they vomit in the house and they vomit in the corridor and then there are people in the corridor smoking. What will you do as a landlord? Do you understand my point? How will you look at this? I lent you this house. I rent you in good faith. Not only did you not take care of it, right? You vomit over my whole my sofa and you turn the whole... The whole place is now in ruins. It's, it's dirty. It's messy. You did not take care of my house. That's exactly what happens. God brought the children of Israel into Canaan, into the promised land, right? But they, they oppressed the poor. They live in their drunken, uh, drunken stupor and, and idol worship, doing all kinds of sexual immorality. And the kings, the kings, the leaders of the land who are supposed to guard the people, supposed to know the laws of God and know how to lead the people like a good shepherd, they themselves are the oppressors. What will you do as a landlord? You understand? So God says, to, I, I keep warning you, but... You keep doing the same thing, so no choice. I have to evict you, evict you out of this, this house, and we have to start all over again. Okay, so that is the situation we are in. So if you look at chapter 11, chapter 11 really picks up from chapter 6. Okay, so let me just give you a bit of a recap of chapter 6. What happened was the, the vision that Isaiah saw, and then the angel, right, asked him, Hear, he hears this voice, right? Whom shall we send? Who will go for us? And then Isaiah said, Here am I, send me. And then this is what the Lord said. I'm going to send you to a people whom after you speak, their hearts are so dull of hearing, their eyes are so blind, they are not going to hear your, your messages. They are not going to repent. So then Isaiah made this comment. I want you to see in Isaiah chapter 6, verse 11 and 13. He said, How long, O Lord, how long are you going to ask me to speak to these rebellious people who will not change? Then God replied him, Until the cities lay waste, lie waste without inhabitants and houses without people, and the land is a desolate waste. I want you, Isaiah, as my servant, as my prophet, to speak and speak and warn and warn and warn, but these people will not hear you. But say until the day judgment comes. Okay, so verse 13. And though a tent remain in it, it will be burned again like a terebinth or an oak, whose stump remains when it is fell. The holy seed is its stump. God says, you see, these people were not here, so they will all be removed. Some will die, some will be taken into captivity. It will be like a tree that is fallen, fell. But there will be a stump, a remnant, and out of this remnant, I will rebuild Israel again. You follow what I'm saying? This is very important. Judgment comes, removes, chastens, but there will remain a remnant. And out of it, God will rebuild again. This picture is the same picture of Noah in, the Noah's, in Noah's ark. Judgment comes, Noah and his family are preserved. And out of them, the world is populated again. This is how God does His work. Okay, so use, using this metaphor of a forest whose trees are cleared and burned, right? Only the stump remains. I want you to see this picture. Then now, in Isaiah chapter 11, verse 1, he picks up this story, okay? It says, There shall come forth a shoot from the stump of Jesse, and a branch from, its root, from his roots shall bear fruit. Okay, next slide, please. In other words, I want you to see that it is out of this stump that a shoot will rise again and the shoot will grow to be, and have branches and it will bear fruit again. So that is the prophetic picture. Church, this is the kind of hope that you and I must have as we go through any trials or storms or failure or valley experiences in our life. 
not enough people know God's Word. And they now go into the world and they live in the world with a lot of challenges. In fact, failures. Expectations of them, but they cannot meet up to those expectations. And because they don't read the Word of God, they have no roadmap how to get out of that depression or how to get out of that dark, dark situation in their life. I, I told you before many times already that there are people who maybe suddenly, okay, they have an investigation happen. And they, their whole world comes crushing down. And then they will they'll say, Pastor, can I meet you? Can we talk? I say, yes, definitely, sure, I will meet you. And they'll say, we cannot eat, we cannot sleep, we do not know what to do now. We are so lost. And I will always share with them I, this kind of message. I will always tell them, whatever comes is not the end. God's thoughts towards you are good thoughts to give you a hope and a future. You need to know the Word of God. You need to see that there is hope. That no matter what, okay, a shoot will grow out of the stump again. Hallelujah. So then the picture is this. This shoot of, the, of Jesse is as if to give a picture that this present Davidic monarchy will come to an end. Because what is this present monarchy, right? Uh, Ahaz, etc., etc., all the way to Hezekiah. These these kings who have come from Judah, these Judean kings who have come from David, they are now going to go down, 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 down till the Babylonian exile. It's as if they will die. And after the return from exile, God is going to bring forth a new David. You understand? Like a new David will come. So that is why it is very interesting because the imagery is not a stump, a, a shoot that will come out of the stump of David. But he says, a shoot that will come out of the stump of Jesse. Who is Jesse? Jesse is David's father. It's as if to, to give the people a hope that a new David is going to come. I want to tell you this, church. There must be death, right, in order for a newness of life to come. That's why in the New Testament, we have this phrase called born again. When you go through the trial and the darkness and the valley, what comes out on the other side is not the same you again. There's something different about you now because your faith has been tested, because you have experienced the grace of God and you have experienced the mercy of God. So now you are a changed person. You are a changed man. You follow what I'm saying? It's like Peter, Peter denying Jesus three times and then being so crushed escaping, running away. And then Jesus restores him again. And now, Jesus makes a statement. Peter, when you are young, you go wherever you wish. But when you are now old, someone will hold you by the hand and gird you and bring you where you do not wish, signifying by what death Peter will glorify God. You become a changed person through this. So how is this going to happen? How is all of these things that I just said, how is it going to happen? And how is God going to bring forth a new restoration to Israel? Verse 2 to 3 tells us, The Spirit of the Lord shall rest upon Him. You see the word Spirit four times. The Spirit of wisdom and understanding. The Spirit of counsel and might. The Spirit of knowledge and of the fear of the Lord. And His delight shall be in the fear of God. One of the things that you will come out after the valley experience is this thing called the fear of God. The reverence for God. Okay, And it's not going to be by your own strength, but it's going to be by the Spirit at work in your life to do this thing. So you can say, this new David, this new Messiah that's to come, he will be marked by the Spirit of God. It's so interesting that because, uh, I want you to see this, okay? Think, think from, from Isaiah's perspective. Isaiah is probably not seeing Jesus, to be honest. Okay? He, you know, maybe you can say, well, but he has a vision, he has a vision. But, I just want to tell you that it is a prophecy about a future coming king, but really it is in the New Testament that the New Testament authors, when they see Jesus, they say this is the king that Isaiah is talking about. Do you follow what I'm saying? And if you read the Gospels, you see that 
the apostles or whoever wrote the gospel said, when Jesus was baptized by John the Baptist, what happened? Heaven opened and the Spirit of God like a dove descended upon him. So the author in the New Testament looking at this, thinking about this, they know the Old Testament scriptures. They will probably be thinking, hey, this is exactly what Isaiah chapter 11 is talking about. The Spirit of the Lord is upon him. Now, if we then look at verses 3, what is the result of such a leader, okay, of such a person? He says, He shall not judge by what his eyes see or decide disputes by what his ears hear. But with righteousness he shall judge the poor and decide with equity for the make of the earth. He will strike the earth with a rod of his mouth and with the breath of his lips he shall kill the wicked. This king is not going to be a warrior king that kills by the sword. He is a king that will rule by the word. His rule will be so radically different from the other Davidic kings. And his emphasis, his strength will be righteousness and justice or righteousness and faithfulness will gird his loin. That means, you know, this is like talking about the most innermost part of his being. Really, like in the Hebrew, it, it has this connotation of underwear. Like, in the most innermost part of him is righteousness and faithfulness. This king will be loyal and faithful and honest in his, in his dealings, in the way he conducts himself as a king in the eyes of God. So he will rule by the word and by wise judgment. And so this brings us back. Okay, let me just tell you, okay, it's very easy. You show sure again full marks for this question. When you think of the Spirit and the Word together, you think of which passage? Genesis chapter 1, verse 3. In the beginning, the earth was without form and void. Darkness. And third verse says, but no, verse, second verse says, the Spirit of the Lord was hovering over the waters. Third verse says, and God said, let there be light and there was light. Spirit and the Word. So this is now a picture of a new creation because there's going to be chaos, right? The Babylonians are going to come and they are going to destroy Jerusalem and the temple. So with the coming of a new king is God's way of bringing about a new creation again. Okay, and so what is the picture of a new creation? What can we expect out of this new creation? Verses 6 to 9 says, the wolf shall dwell with the lamb, and the leopard shall lie down with the young goat, and the calf and the lion and the fattened calf together, and a little child shall lead them. And verse 9 says, They shall not hurt or destroy in all my holy mountain. So in other words, it's a picture of harmony. Okay, That's why you have animals. You have human beings and animals dwelling together in harmony. Shalom, shalom. So this is a picture of restored new creation and the new earth, of Shalom. And this new king, this new David, he will bring Shalom. Where wolves and lambs, leopards and young goats, calf and lions can all dwell together and have a restored relationship. They will not hurt anymore. Meaning, there will be no more wars. Hey, when we read this passage, right, we are doing the thing, ah, one day in heaven, one day in heaven, we are all going to lie down with the lions. And the lion, we're going to see the lion and the lamb. But really, if you read Isaiah's perspective, he's talking about that day will come when this new David comes, this new Messiah comes. And this is how God is going to do it. So that's why from Isaiah chapter 9, verse 6, which just quickly, okay, briefly, I do a recap again. Do you remember Isaiah chapter 9, verse 6 says, For unto us a child is born, a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder. How do you, what will he be called? He'll be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government and of what? Peace. There will be no end. He will be that new David that will establish peace again. Follow? So, short summary, okay? This present, what have we learned so far? This present monarchy will come to an end. God's judgment is like death, like the flood. It's going to wash them away. And then there will be a hope again in a new king who will be born. 
restoration of a new creation, shalom. Like the rainbow, God's covenant after the flood. He will establish a new kingdom, uphold it with justice and righteousness. This is the fruit of, of, of this kingdom. How? God Himself will do it. God Himself will do it. So who is this new king? Okay, who is this new king? From Isaiah's perspective, like I say, he doesn't think straight away Jesus. From his perspective, in his time, we are hoping, hoping, hoping. Hezekiah, Hezekiah probably comes close, okay? And which is why I'm going to jump. I just want to give a heads up that next week onwards, we will jump straight away into Judah, Jerusalem, and then into Hezekiah. We will skip a lot of chapters in between because those are pronouncement or judgments against the other nations, which we will skip, I told you before. But Hezekiah is not that king because a lot of things must happen, okay? One thing that must happen is this. Look at Isaiah 11, verses 11 to 12. I'm still at Isaiah 11. It says, In that day, when this new king comes, okay, that the remnants from everywhere, they are, the Jews are being scattered, they will all come from Assyria, from Egypt, from Patros, Cush, Elam, Shina, Hamath, etc., etc. And then he says, He will raise a signal for the nations and will assemble the banished of Israel and gather the, the dispersed of Judah from the four corners of the earth. It didn't happen in the time of Hezekiah. There wasn't such a dispersion and there wasn't such a regathering. But, if you look at your next slide, in Acts chapter 2, verse 5 to 10, this is where we read that on the day of Pentecost, there were dwelling in Jerusalem Jews, devout men from every nation under heaven, and at the sound of this, of what the apostles were, were, were speaking, they are praising God, right? Verse 7 says, they were all amazed and astonished, saying, uh, why are these people, why are we hearing them speak in our own language? Verse 6, sorry. Verse 9 says, these people are from the Parthians, Medes, Ilia, Iliamax, residents of Mesopotamia, from Judea, Cappadocia, Pontus, Asia, that's the north part, Phrygia, Pamphylia, the west part, and then Egypt, the south. Do you see? So, from the New Testament author's perspective, when on the day of Pentecost, when the Holy Spirit comes upon the 120 of them and they start to praise God and sing in tongues, or praise in tongues, and all the people around, the author says, hey, this is the regathering. Do you follow what I'm saying? This is what Isaiah is talking about. So this is how we should look at the Bible, like one story, one story from Old Testament into the New Testament. So while Isaiah does not specify who this king is, the New Testament author draws our attention to Jesus as the one who has fulfilled all these prophecies. Jesus is that Davidic descendant, son of David, by birth. But he is, old, but he is God's son by resurrection. Think of it this way. Think of Jesus as a descendant of David. Come, come, come to him, okay? Then he dies to end this line of sin, sinful kingship, to end it completely entrust his life to God. And then God says, all right, now I will raise him up as like that new David. And from him begins a new generation of believers made up of Jews and Gentiles, the church. And they will come under his kingship and his lordship. And he will be the king of kings and the lord of lords. I tell you, if you don't have the New Testament, you will not see all these things. It's the way the coming of Jesus and the New Testament author's perspective that helps us piece this whole story together. And that is the most amazing thing. This hope that I began the sermon talking to you about, right? This hope finally is fulfilled. And how was it fulfilled? It's fulfilled beautifully. It's fulfilled in a way that is beyond our comprehension and our expectation. And that's how God will work in your life. He will do it in a way that you cannot imagine or even ask for. God Himself will do it so that all glory belongs to Him. So, 
the reflection is this, what message and hope can we see in all these passages so far? We see peace, that in Christ we can dwell in the shalom of the new creation. So now, I'm no longer talking about animals now, I'm talking about the church, okay? That under the rulership of this new Messiah, if the wolves and the lambs and the lions can all dwell together, and even the, the bears can eat grace, uh, grace the grass, what, does, what is this picture when it comes to us? How is it relevant for us as a church? That is, we can live in shalom. We can live with people who are different from us. We do not need to fight anymore. So when Christians are for war, okay, I always ask myself, do you know the Bible? If you really understand the Word of God and what Christ has come to do, you will not be shouting for war or shouting a war cry, saying, come, let's go to fight. That's why Jesus' message is, love your enemies, do good to them, pray for them, bless them. If they slap you on the one side, you give the other side. Because now He is the King of this new kingdom. New creation, a new humanity, a new way of living. The second thing we see is newness of life. That in Christ, there is always this hope of a resurrection after death. No matter how the situation is, restoration is possible. So don't be afraid. So now when you finish chapter 11 this way, you enter into chapter 12. And what is that? Chapter 12 is very short. It's actually a hymn or a psalm of praise. When you see and understand what God is going to do, the prophet cannot help but to enter into a moment of praise to Him. That's, why we, that's what we are doing in church. You come to church, you hear the sermon. After we hear the sermon, usually we will have a response song. And the response song is a worship song. And what am I trying to do when I ask you to do that? I'm asking you, after you hear God's Word and you know what God is doing, wouldn't you stand up and lift up your hands in praise to Him? You understand what I'm saying? Yeah. So that's what we do, okay? Then chapter 13 all the way to chapter 23 deals with prophecies against the nations. This is the part that I say I will skip. Okay, now, chapter 13 is really a judgment against Babylon. So for all the ten nations, the first nation that was mentioned of God's judgment is actually Babylon. And later I'll explain to you why. Because Babylon has always been held in contrast with Jerusalem. There are always these two cities. You understand? In the book of Revelation, you will read Babylon mentioned again but it's always mentioned in light of the city, the new Jerusalem that's going to come down. Do you want to go to Babylon or you want to go to the new Jerusalem? Remember in the book of, uh, of Revelation? Babylon is always picture, a picture of the harlot in the book of Revelation. And then the church, the new Jerusalem, is a picture of the bride of Jesus Christ. So there's always this contrast between these two cities, Jerusalem, God's holy city, and Babylon, the city of the world. The city of great fanfare and pomp and celebration and riches, but it is not a city that God dwells. It's a city that God judges. Okay, so that's why it's put as the first city in these na ten nations. Uh, uh, I should say, this first nation among these ten nations. Now, but Babylon will eventually face God's wrath and destruction. And I just want to quickly go through with you just two passages in Isaiah 13. Just to show you, the whole chapter is about the judgment on Babylon, okay? Look at verse 9. Verse 9 says, Behold, the day of the Lord comes, cruel with wrath and fierce anger, to make the land a desolation. Which land? Babylon. And to destroy its sinners from it. Okay, look at verse 10. For the stars of the heavens and their constellations will not give their light. The sun will be dark at its rising, and the moon will not shed its light. You see, this phrase, right, the sun will not shine and the moon will not give its light. You think, oh, yeah, 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 I remember this verse. In the Gospels, it's mentioned and also in the book of Revelation. So you think, oh, it's talking about the last day of the cataclysmic event. No, in Isaiah, it's talking about Babylon as a nation that will be judged by God. So this phrase, how do you understand it? Okay, I checked this with you before, but let me tell you. 
In Genesis, right? Remember, there was darkness. So what did God do? Let there be light. And there was light. And then God created the sun, the moon, and the stars. The creation of the sun, moon, and stars is a creation language. Bringing chaos into order. Now, in Isaiah 13, we are seeing a decreation language where order is, become, has, is becoming chaos. The sun will not shine. The moon will not give its light. The constellations, the stars will become dim. Decreation. What does that mean? Judgment. Babylon, you are so high and lifted up. But now you'll be brought low because of your pride. It's not the end of the world. It's just a language. Okay? So, if we then look at verse, verse 17, I'm stirring up the meats against them. So, already Isaiah in chapter 13 already mentions that one day, who is going to overcome Babylon? The media Persians. The, the Persians are going to come. The meats are going to come. And verse 19 says, And Babylon, the glory of kingdoms, the splendor and the pomp of the Chaldeans will be like Sodom and Gomorrah when God overthrew them. So chapter 13 is a judgment against Babylon. Our interest today is chapter 14. Because chapter 14 is about the king of Babylon. So the reason why I want to share with you chapter 11 and chapter 14 is because I want you to see the contrast between the king who will come to rule Jerusalem and the king of Babylon. So in chapter 14, okay, if I can say it this way, if chapter 11 is the future king of Israel, chapter 14 shows us the king of Babylon. This contrast is the same way the book of Revelation is written, full of this side-by-side -side contrast. I told you before, the new Jerusalem or Babylon, the bride of Christ or the harlot, the, the beast, you want to follow the beast or you want to follow the Lamb of God. This kind of juxtaposition to contrast. This is the way they write the Bible. If you understand it, then you will not go into something very mystical and all kinds of thinking about the future. Just look at the Word of God and understand it in history and its fulfillment in Jesus Christ. Okay, come, let's go. Chapter 14, verse 1 to 3, okay? Look, there are three parts to this. First part is verse 1 to verse 3. Verses 1 to 3. And it is about a promise to the Judeans who are in exile in Babylon. God's comfort to them is this, verse 1. The Lord will have compassion on Jacob and will again choose Israel. Okay? And he will set them in their own land and sojourners will join them and will attach themselves to the house of Jacob. So you can see it is as if they have already assumed that they are now in exile. Isaiah says, God will have compassion on you again and will again choose you and bring you back. Okay? Look at verse 3. When the Lord has given you rest from your pain and your turmoil and the hard service with which you were made to serve. Okay, so that's the first part. A promise to the Judeans who are in exile in Babylon. Now, the second part is very interesting. Verses 4 to verses 21. Okay, let's, let's, let's look at this. There are four stanzas here, and it is a mockery of a creaturely king who is, wants to exhort himself to the place of God. You may have heard of this passage before, and it is the verse that says, Oh, you Lucifer, son of the morning, how you have fallen from heaven. So now, listener, in the NKJV Bible, it uses the word Lucifer. But in the ESV, which is what we are using now, it doesn't mention Lucifer. The original meaning is not Satan or Lucifer. The original is just morning star. So do you see how translation can just turn your attention away to something way, way off? Before our church started, right, I was toying, do I do NKJV or do I do ESV? Then because I went to Singapore Bible College and I realized that a lot, a lot, a lot of the students and professors are using NK, uh, ESV, sorry, English Standard Version and NIV Version. So I decided that, okay, right, uh, all my life I use NKJV, but never mind, I'm going to just put it aside, I'm going to go ESV all the way. 
And now I'm beginning to see that NKJV has some translation that really can lead you down a path of, of, of thinking that is not in its original uh, words. So this passage is not about Satan, really. It's really talking about the king of Babylon. And again, this, oh, you morning star, how you have fallen, right? It is not about how Satan has fallen from heaven. It's just another kind of language language, to show you how this king of Babylon who, who thinks he can be God, he exhausts himself as if he can be, he can be higher than the gods to be the ruler, like, like a god, to be like a god. He will be brought low in death. So let's go through these four stanzas of a mockery of the king of Babylon, okay? Now, then we will bring the message to an end. So, the first part is about a rest for the earth. What does that mean? Okay, let me show you verse 4 to 8. You will take up this torn, that means this mockery, against the king of Babylon. How the oppressor has ceased, the insolent fury ceased. The Lord has broken the staff of the wicked, the scepter of rulers, that struck the peoples in wrath with unceasing blows, that rule the nations in anger with unrelenting persecution. The whole earth is at rest and quiet. They break forth into singing. The cypresses rejoice at you, the cedars of Lebanon, saying, Since you were laid low, no woodcutter comes up against us. Oh, so what happened was this. In those days, when the kings are going to war, when the kings are powerful, they want to build more palaces, they want to build roads, they chop down trees. They chop down trees to show their power and their pride. <laughs> so the earth now rejoices at the earth. So this is almost like for those creation care people and those people who are, you know, green uh, activists, right? They'll be very happy with this verse. Basically, it's saying that the earth now feels like, ah, oh, we can rest. Because you, king of Babylon, you are now, you are now cast down. You have fallen. Okay, so that's just the first part. To say that the earth are rejoicing. Number two, the underworld ridicules him. Okay, so in this poem, second part, verses 9 to 11, it says, Sheol beneath is stirred up to meet you when you come. It rouses the shades to greet you, all who were leaders of the earth. It, raise, it raises from their thrones all who were kings of the nations. All of them will answer and say to you, You too have become as weak as we. You have become like us. It's almost like the kings who are in Sheol, that means the underworld, the place where the dead dwells. And when the king of Babylon comes, right, they go like, ha, 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 you also. You are so proud. You went around killing so many people, killing all of us. Now you are as weak as us. The underworld ridicules him. Can you follow? Okay, let's go on to the third one, which is the exciting part, right? Heaven ridicules him. Verses 12 to 15. How you are fallen from heaven, O day star. So this is the part where NKJV translates as Lucifer, but the ESV version says, O day star, son of dawn. How you are cast down to the ground, you who laid the nations low. You say in your heart, I will ascend to heaven above the stars of God. I will set my throne on high. I will sit on the mount of assembly in the far reaches of the, of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the, of the clouds. I will make myself like the most high. So what he's trying to do is in the ancient time, they had this idea, okay, this thought that God sits in a divine council and God, Yahweh, is the highest God in this divine council. You, this picture is in the book of Job. Remember, God says, you know, have you considered my servant Job? He looks like he's talking to somebody like that. There's a divine council. So this king of Babylon thought he wants to be part of this divine council. He wants to go above the clouds into the heavenly realm because of his power, his might, his pride. He said, I can do it. I can be like God. So this is the part that, oh, you have fallen. Look at verse 15. But you are brought down to Sheol, to the far reaches of the pit. He wants to set his throne in the heavens to sit above the clouds like a god. But heaven says, you go back down to the place that you belong in Sheol, down to the pit. 
And finally, the picture that is given to us is a picture of a battlefield. And this is the part where we now see he is a fallen king. Look at verse 16, chapter 14. Those who see you will stare at you and ponder over you. Is this the man who made the earth tremble, who shook kingdoms, who made the world like a desert and overthrew its cities, who did not let his prisoners go home? That means in a battle, right? In a battle, after the king dies and all the people come by and look at him and say, and stare at him and say, are you the one who destroyed nations and killed so many people? Look at you now. So then he continues to say, verse 19, You are cast down, you are cast out, away from your grave, like a loaf branch clothed with the slain, eh? those who are died, those pierced by the sword, who go down to the stones of the pit like a dead body trampled underfoot. Verse 20, You will not be joined with them in burial because you have destroyed your land. You have slain your people. May the offspring of evildoers never more be named. I want, to, I want you to see verse 18. All the kings of the nations lie in glory, each in his own tomb, but you are cast out away from your grave. Because you are so proud, you die in battle, in battle, and you are not even able to have a proper burial. While the rest of the kings, they lie in their own tomb in glory. This is the problem of pride. This is what the Bible is trying to show us. But do you see the difference between chapter 11 and chapter 14? Because in chapter 11, you had the king, the coming king, and the Bible says the Spirit of the Lord will be upon him. He is going to be a, a king who is empowered by God's Spirit. He is not a proud king who says, I will do it myself. I will ascend into the heavens. So if we try to exalt ourselves to heaven... He who exalts himself will be humbled. But he who humbles himself will be exalted. The conclusion I want to bring to this message is this. We see this, right, just now. A shoot of Jesse will come from the stump. Death to the old lineage of David, but God will bring a new David. God turns chaos into order. Every judgment and decreation is to bring forth a new creation. This hope will come from a king who will be born and the Spirit of the Lord will rest upon him. Right? We saw this. But let's talk about Babylon. Babylon has always been represented as an opposite to Jerusalem by a share with you. Jerusalem is a city of God. Babylon is a lure of the world. In the story, right, you can say in Isaiah 11, the king in Isaiah 11 is a protagonist. How Haorena. The king in Isaiah 14 is an antagonist. If you want to use Star Wars, the king in Isaiah 14 is the emperor. The leader in Isaiah 11 is Luke Skywalker. You follow what I'm saying? In life, right? In life, when you read the Bible, you can read it like a story and ask yourself. It's just like you watch a movie and you'll be able to pick up the principles, the message that it contains. In the story, the characters portray good and evil. Villains, we call them, okay? But villains are not necessarily always evil. Villains are just opposite to the main character. Do you understand what I'm saying? And let me tell you this, okay? There are times, right, where a villain exists within the good character. Like, for example, in the story of the Lord of the Rings, the struggle that Frodo had in bringing the ring to destruction, that inside him, there is another voice, and this voice that lasts for power, that is tempted to evil and to sin. So when I read Isaiah 11 and Isaiah 14, I'm not just thinking this is a long, long time ago issue. Why, why are we learning today? This is a very present day issue. It is a question about do you choose to follow the lamb or the beast? Will you come into Christ's kingdom, a kingdom that is blessed forever, or will you come under the king of Babylon that is ready to be judged? There is a king of Babylon in us somewhere 
who wants to rear his ugly head, who keeps on wanting to come up and say, I will do it. I, I will be like God. That villain, that opposite, to the voice of the Spirit of God that tells you, stay humble. Depend on my strength. Spend time with me. Know God's Word. There is this voice on the inside of us. I'll end with this verse because I think it's so amazing in the light of what we have seen in 11 and 14. And this verse is in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 22 to 25. It says, For Jews demand signs and Greeks seek wisdom, but we preach Christ crucified, a stumbling block to Jews and folly to Gentiles. But to those who are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God and the wisdom of God. Think of this phrase, Christ, the power of God and the wisdom of God, and in light of Isaiah 11. Christ is completely not Isaiah 14. Christ is completely not the king of Babylon. He never once said, I will do it, I will accept. He said, I humble myself as a servant, a bond servant, to the point of death, the death on the cross. That's what Philippians say. And God has highly exalted him to be the name above every other name. To the Jews, what is this? They despise it. To the Jews, they say, this is a stumbling block. To the Gentiles, folly, foolishness. Verse 25 says, but the foolishness of God is wiser than men and the weakness of God is stronger than men. Do we follow Christ or the King of Babylon? Which direction, which way will we choose in life? So Isaiah is amazing. It gives you so much. It links so many things in the New Testament because it's such a big book, such an important book. But I pray that today, when you hear sermons like this, it allows you to go back and reflect and think. That's why I say, it's spoken about kings, right? If you are a person in leadership, in positions of influence, what, how will you behave? How will you live your life? That is the question we all need to ask ourselves. Come. We're just going to, uh, I, I told the musicians not to come up first because we're going to have communion together. And I think that it's good that we take this time and this moment to be silent and to ask ourselves the question, what is this communion cup and bread? It's a covenant. It's a covenant that Jesus instituted by His own death. Amen? So that you and I can be saved. And so with this gratitude, we come before God and we thank Him. We thank Jesus for His obedience to the Father. If you are here in this place, you are a Christian and you, uh, you, you can partake of this communion with us. If you don't have a cup, you can lift up your hands and the ushers will just help you and serve you. But this time of communion and this cup is also a time for us to be humble because we are saved by grace. If not what, for what Christ has done, we will not be here. So let's just, as we close our eyes and bow our heads, in humility we come before God. In humility we do self-reflection and say, Lord, thank you. Thank you for your obedience. Thank you that, Lord, we can, we can have a good king to follow, a good shepherd to be our example. That we too should also learn to lay down our lives for others. Forgive us of our sins, our selfishness, our pride, O oh Lord. Help us today through the sermon, through the text, the scripture, renew our mind, guide our every step. And we thank you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Right now, the scripture says, for I receive from the Lord what I also delivered to you the night that Jesus was betrayed he took he he took bread yeah, and when he had given thanks he broke it 
And he said, take it, this is my body that is broken for you. Come, let's eat of it together. He took the cup and said, this is the blood of a new covenant. As often as you drink it, you do it in remembrance of him. Let's drink it together. Amen. Are you all blessed today? Yeah? Did you learn anything? We're just going to sing the song, the second worship song, I Worship You, Almighty God, as a response to what we have heard today in the sermon, as a worship unto Him. If you have just you have passed the cups to the owls and the ushers, you can stand up on our feet. Let's all prepare our hearts in, in humility before the Lord. We worship Him. Amen. I worship Worship you, Almighty God. There is none like you. I worship you, O Prince of Peace. There is one. Father, we thank you that there is always hope that even in, a, in judgment, in the most catastrophic situation, a shoot will rise out of the stump. And you, Lord, will do it yourself. By your Spirit, you will accomplish this work. You will raise up a people who will know your Word. And by the power of your Holy Spirit and through the preaching and the teaching of your Word, you will shepherd your people and you will bring change to this world. Your kingdom will come and your will will be done in this way. We thank you, O God, for Jesus who became our risen King, who was obedient to the point of death so that, Lord, we can have an example to follow. Thank you, O Lord Jesus, for all that you have done for us. Thank you that, Lord, we can come before you today to hear your word and to see the difference that the King of Babylon has brought. He has brought destruction and death. But you, Lord Jesus, through your own death, has brought life and life everlasting for, for thousands and for millions of people. Their families can be changed. Lives can be changed. Hope can arise in our hearts again. So I pray, O oh Lord, that you give us the opportunity to share this story with as many people, Lord, that you will bring into our life through our own testimony, through our own life, Lord, we want to share this hope that we have in Christ Jesus. And bless this church, bless us, we pray, as we depart from here. In Jesus' name we pray, and everyone say, Amen, Amen. Amen. Let's give the Lord praise today. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Amen. 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 Come, let's just close this time.
praying the Lord's Prayer again, believing and asking God for His will to come, His will, His kingdom to come, His will to be done on earth as it is in heaven, and that God will use us as instruments to do that. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be Your name. Your kingdom come, Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And do not lead us into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Amen. Church, the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make His face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn His face toward you and give you peace. May the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God our Father and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen. And amen. 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 God bless you. Amen. Amen. God bless you. You may be dismissed. Alright, go in the peace of the Lord and have a good dinner. God bless.